Because we know that in that spot basis, the configuration is actually expansion convert this, but there is a serious drawback because in the hat fog <coughs> basis, those uh, electron electron matrix elements, in fact, are not diagonal, so therefore I need NB to the power 4 matrices. Uh, if you think about how big can I then use a basis, well, then already, if I have 100 basis functions and you do take that to the power 4, you get a pretty big number, actually, the limit of any standard computer memory. So, clearly, this is not the way to proceed. So, the solution is to use a mixed single classical basis set, Hatch-Fock, to describe bound state excitation, and the fine element DDR to describe the excitation to the continuum. So it's shown here graphically. Here in the center region, we have many FE DDR functions, but I, I take linear combinations of them to obtain a few Hatch-Fock orbitals and pseudo orbitals that describe accurately the bound state part of the spectrum. And then I have a discretized basis out here. And I can think about uh, for example, this basis function here, I can think about that as this one here. This would be one of them, but I have the electron in that particular EBR function. Uh, the advantage is illustrated here, namely, you get a very efficient diagonal uh, storage of the electron electron correlation, and then you get. Um, <clears throat> of course, something which is not diagonal, but it's only part of the matrix. So this is uh, what we have done. Uh, so here is the recipe how to formulate the theory. You have, you have to know what you're looking at. <laughs> so you have to set up, you have to know what system you're looking at to define the potentials. Then you set up the FEDR basis. This is well explained in the literature. So you can construct the four optals in those textbooks that I mentioned. Described how to find the hard support orbitals. I also told you how to construct the pseudo orbitals. And then <coughs> we can transform into the big mixed spaces and construct the, the space that we're interested in. And we can compute the matrix elements. Uh, you can use, uh, when you have matrix elements between terminals, you normally refer to uh, later condom rules as possible. Uh, nowadays, there are much more clever ways to. <coughs> which you will also find in the, the digital list in the, in the end. And then you can prepare the initial state and you can perform time propagation. So here's an example of the convergence. So this is now just a test example. One the helium, this is the attraction, this is the uh, repulsion between the two electrons, this is the energy of the ground state obtained from the TDC. And then we do at the FOC. In a, full, in, a, in, a, in a big box and in a small box, and then we do these different approximations here, uh, like single active electron, configuration interaction singles, configuration interaction with a small active space, larger active space, and so on and so forth. And what you see, well, the point I want to make here is that you get, of course, convergence as you go down here, you get convergence to the accurate number here. But to get full convergence, you need many, many configurations. But maybe it's not necessary to get super good convergence. Maybe it's OK to have maybe this convergence for the actual problem. And then you have only 200 configurations instead of 4,700. That's, that's, that's the point. That's the key point here. And uh, so this was for the ground state. Let's look, let's look at the physics of how this works, because now there is some uh, physics into it. Here we took uh, again helium uh, and calculated the spectrum. So what is this? This is the energy and this is the spectral intensi intensity. And what we did was nothing else but exciting this just for this test calculation. We just took such a, a, a Gaussian pulse, just some some uh, half cycle pulse, short pulse, to excite everything, and then we calculate the dipole and take the Fourier transform. This is what is called. So this is the response of the system. And what you see here is that you have, you have some excited states here. You have the ionization potential. And you have some doubly excited states uh, for, say, n equal 2. You have some doubly excited states for n equal 3, and so on and so forth. This is TDC result. Let's now see how this uh, new theory uh, competes with this. 
And this first one I show you is a single active electron approximation. It's pretty good at describing the excited states here. Of course, it, there's no, absolutely no way it can describe the d stop excited state because I only have one electron out there. The same is true for this time dependent configuration interaction singles because I only allow one electron in the continuum. But then I can take, for example, uh, include these two states in my active space. Uh, so I just include the first virtual orbital here. And then you see already this one, you can get uh, also the dot side states described. And when we <coughs> proceed, including more and more, we can also get the second family of double side states, and so on and so forth. <coughs> What's the point here? The point is that this is now it's, this is now capturing the physics, and it's much more economical. And maybe the problem I'm interested in is such that I don't care about this stuff up here, right? If, for example, if I somehow have physics going on up to this energy, I don't care about this stuff up here. And therefore, it's much more economical just to use a calculation where this is included instead of doing this calculation, which is much more expensive. Um, so in this way, this, this technology here can be tuned to the physics you're interested in. Uh, this is the window. It's, it's, the conclusions are the same as before. It's just to show that we can also do four electrons. So the more uh, the more configurations you put in here in the inner region, the better you can do. So, as I say, systematic ad adding of correlation uh, contributions improves uh, the accuracy. And also, if you want to compare with experiment, of course, because we can add in a controlled way states to the system, we can very easily identify the physics. If there is a spectrum that we need to compare uh, our theory with, we add structure and correlation until we describe that. And, uh, so this, this is uh, now in progress, and it has been applied a little bit. We have extended the code to 3 e helium. And this just basically shows you that we can also calculate some excited states in, in helium. We can also do the William, and we can also do H2. So we didn't. Uh, yeah, there are a few papers out now on this, uh, but mainly in 1D. We haven't done so much in 3D at this point. In the last five minutes or so, oh, I, I can't remember how long. Do I have until 11? So this, uh, up to this point, uh, what are the elements? The elements is, are that we cannot afford all different configurations. That's too expensive computationally. We have to take some of them. And taking some of them is this active space constant. Uh, but there is, of course, uh, another way, or, or the, it's possible to add another element to this. Let's, let's, to illustrate what I mean by this, uh, concept of a time-bearing basis. Look at this thing. Assume, assume that you have only these three basis states uh, available to describe what is going on. For some reason, this is this. You could only treat three orbitals in your computation, and for some reason, you have these three because they were needed for other reasons. Then, if the true evolution of the system after a while is like this, there's absolutely no way you can describe it. Right? But this basis stops here. That's, I hope that's clear. But if now these orbitals were allowed to follow in some opt optimal way the true evolution of the system out here, right? If now these orbitals in each time step, as we do the propagation, were allowed to change, to change in the correct way, there was a chance that we could describe this even with three orbitals. That's the idea about the time varying basis. And this is the, now this answer is here. And then the idea is, of course, that we can do with much fewer orbitals, right? Instead of having uh, to, to instead of having to build up a, uh, a single particle basis with orbitals describing the full space in the start, we can maybe do a few and let them move around. Uh, and uh, this we described, and uh, it's complicated. And I don't want to go into the detail here. I want to point out a few things which are good to know if you want to do theory. Uh, and 
<coughs> the first thing which is good to know is that it, that all of this type of theories, uh, with orbital optimization, with or without, uh, whether it's for a fermionic system or whether it's for a bosonic system, they are all derived from the same uh, origin. So how many of you know about Ospitevsky equation for BC? Okay, half. Yes? Okay, so that's bosons. And uh, that equation is uh, typically derived from this kind of machinery. So, so the Ospitevsky equation describes very cool bosonic samples. Uh, so, and and uh, it, what you have to do to derive this type of stuff is that you have to decide what kind of ansatz you want to have for your wave function. This is, this is the first thing. And I decided I want to have this. But if I were to derive the uh, Ospitevsky equation for bosons, at this point I would just say that I have a product of orbitals which are all the same for the different uh, bosons. Anyway, uh, so I have more freedom here. And then when you have that, what you have to do is, well, at least one way to do it, and, and we see, uh, at least from my point of view, seems to work out pretty nicely and very generally, is to consider this action uh, integral here and then to seek stationary points. So you have to stuff this in and then to have to do variation. Let's just, because maybe this stuff with variation is not so uh, well known, let's just forget about this term here and consider what we have here. Uh, the principle states that, you, that the optimum, uh, that, the, that, that the equations of motion follow from this when you have a stationary point. So let's now just uh, look at this part here and assume that all possible variations in this wave functions are allowed. So I put here delta psi. For any delta psi, this should be zero. What does this then have to be? If this integral for any delta psi, any crazy delta psi I put in, this integral here should be zero, what, what does this necessarily have to be? Zero, right? And what is this? This is the time dependence Schrodinger equation. So the time dependence Schrodinger equation, if all, all possible variations are allowed, follows directly from this principle. And, and uh, then this is also the principle we use if we don't have all possible variations, but only variations allowed within this specification of Prometheus. So this is what we do, uh, of course, following a very clever people, and um, then you get a horrible equation, <laughs> right? And uh, so I don't even want to go through this at this point, but uh, this, is, uh, this is how theoretical physics is. I mean, <laughs> sometimes it's easy, uh, sometimes it's not, and this is uh, technically kind of difficult. But the gain here is that you can do with much fewer orbitals, and the hope is that you can go to much bigger systems. There's a whole family of this type of stuff. Here I want to uh, give you some uh, words to remember. You can have singles, S here, where you have one orbital out of the ground state. You can also have singles and doubles, where you can have one orbital out of the ground state, or two orbitals out of the ground state. This is this quantum chemistry way of saying things, singles, doubles, and of course triples and so on and so forth. And uh, I think I skip this now, and uh, I want to show you just this picture here, uh, which captures uh, that as you increase the number of electrons and look at the number of operations that are needed to do a calculation, we can do uh, maybe time dependent hard clock. We can also maybe do this kind of new theories uh, at the singles and doubles levels. But to do a full calculation, which uh, would be this multi-configured time event at the clock, is impossible when the system becomes bigger. So this, this, is, uh, this is one of the motivations for doing what we're doing here. Uh, this, this is saying the same. Uh, it's like you have something about numerical cost and you have something about approximation. If you don't, matter, if you don't care so much about uh, the quality of your calculation, you can do here. But if you want something which is more accurate, you have to go up here somewhere. It also, this, this, this statement was not entirely correct because for some processes, 
time dependent as well is probably always sufficient. It depends a lot on what the observer is. So the conclusion is that this time dependent restricted to space self consistent field method offers reduction in the number of configurations. These properties I skipped, but it's just nice to know that it's gauge invariant, and in, and in some cases it has some special convergence properties. And we are uh, thinking that this is a feasible and promising tool, uh, but this is still a work in progress. And uh, yeah, so the progress is uh, the outlook is to do more efficient 3D implementations and also to maybe formulate the same things for, for some cases. So this kind of general uh, theory. So just, uh, I'd like to give you a couple of reviews here where people discuss the many time dependent many body problem. So I found the first of these two quite useful and I also put uh, and then that also put our own papers here. That's it. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> I should mention all the guys that work on this. That's very important. And the one. So you didn't do all that by yourself. <laughs> no, I no, I, I supervise the process sometimes. Questions? Fred, and then what? So, can you say a little bit about the time that hard to plot for strong field problems? Because all the examples I've seen of it, it didn't work very well. Yeah. There is, there, there is um, I think this this relates a lot to the observable that you're interested in. I, I personally now remember one work which was published uh, last year in this review letters from uh, Amish Quincy, where they looked at the total ionization yield of CO2 and CO, I think, as a function of, uh, say, this is the polarization axis. And then they could vary the uh, alignment degree of the molecule. So if, and for, and for, for that observable, so total yield as a function of alignment angle, he actually uh, got quite a good result with time dependent on the problem. Good measure how fair it in, in the sense that he could compare with uh, a more advanced theory. He, he, he has a separate program which is similar to this one. Uh, where where he, he has built up a machinery where okay so now when you start doing this type of development you have early on you have to make a decision. Do you want to do it basically build it up yourself with your own base sets and all that stuff? Or do you want to try to make something that interfaces with programs that are already available uh, from the quantum chemistry community? We took the decision that we want to build it up ourselves. Uh, I mean, Squinchy and others have taken the track that they want to try to interface this electron that goes out with a kind of standard quantum chemistry codes describing the energy. So what Armin has, he has a code which uh, can describe the structure very accurately in the cation based on quantum chemistry calculations. And then he adds a basis set for the electron that goes out. So he, he has a, it's kind of, he has a natural uh, resolution channels. And that method is now also running. And he uh, did the same calculations for I think it was CO2 and CO. Uh, with that method, obtained converse results and compared with the time dependent block. And, and in that sense, he uh, was act, uh, able to validate the time dependent block. There, there is another example from a PRL, I think 2014 or so, also on CO, uh, on time dependent block from some Chinese, uh, from a Chinese group. I can't remember the names now. But they also seem to capture uh, behavior in CO, which was, which is at least consistent with measurements performed from line of uh, But it's 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 at this level, it's too early to conclude much, in my opinion, because uh, the experiment, for example, from Berna was done in very high intensity in circle polarized fields, and 
Yeah. Well, the example I know, for instance, Ken Coolender in the what, mid 90s yeah. did a type of a perfect <coughs> one for, I think it was 1D helium, so we could do it exactly, and we could yeah. do it with the type of an arbitrary fog. Yeah. I think he was looking at the non sequential normalization. Exactly. This and it doesn't work. It did terrible work. Yeah. And this is because in this case, you have you have only one spatial autism. <laughs> except that except that Mitch Benzola did it a little later with an unrestricted arbitrary fog, so that you had two orbitals. Yeah. And even that was pretty terrible at yeah. the time. But one could expect that that would be better. Better, yeah, but still not good. Yeah, yeah, sure. No, but it's, uh, the, the example you, you mentioned is, is, is uh, on two, two electric radar. Right. The, the one from Armin was this one. I think so you're thinking like one electron observables would be okay? Uh, no. I so think okay. maybe integral one electron observables. Okay. <laughs> but I, can't, I, I don't know. I mean, I, the thing is too early for me to conclude. What do you ask the question? Yeah. So, um, um, for say ionization calculation, would it be possible to neglect the interaction between uh, like continuous states because they are more extended? Uh, maybe maybe that like interactions are that important there uh, for for interaction of solute and uh, coral because those electrons that are not free. So you you. So you, the question is, as far as I understand it, whether one can neglect the electron, electron interaction between a continuum electron and some bound state electrons. Yes, and also between continuum electrons. And also between continuum electrons. Yes, this, this, this uh, can be done sometimes, but not in general. Yeah. So I mean, it, it's just the, the the, actually, we don't know how to describe the, 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 the continuum wave for two electrons. This is an unsolved problem. So if you have two electrons in the continuum of one nucleus, we don't know uh, what to do. I mean, we can do stuff, but it's not exact. Uh, and it's important to somehow account for that electron wave. Because it's long range. This, this is the... Uh, this is the problem we have in, in uh, AMO physics that this coulomb is, uh, is so long range. This is what makes it difficult. <coughs> Lars, uh, beautiful presentation of the theory, but I know the, the applications you're interested in are two molecules. Yeah. So could you say something about how you apply this to multi-center currents? Yeah. It, yes. So it. So this is this project started in 2009, and then uh, we spent a long time just to formulate the theory, and then we have spent some time to try to see how it works in 1D, and then we have spent also a couple of years trying to actually implement it in 3D, and this was done first for atoms, and this is now in progress, and at the same time we do it for uh, molecules. And um, the, there are two, two approaches at this, at this point. One approach is to use still a spherical uh, coordinate representation, even for the molecular moves in the case. So just one origin. Then, of course, if I have a molecule like this, I, I already need quite a few angular momentum to describe the ground state in the molecule, because the nuclei are at fixed position with respect to that origin. But, if the, but that can be done, and anyway, the, the photon field will pump in some angular momentum into the system. And if the, if, the vibrate, if the vibration motion we're interested in is not too big, this seems plausible. Alternatively, what we have done for fixed nuclear calculation is that we have considered diatomics, and then we have used the spread of what they call proletaroid coordinates, where the diatomic problem separates. So there's, there's uh, those two ways. But it's also clear at this point that you, you cannot, uh, the, it's not that this solves anything, <laughs> everything. It's, di it's a difficult problem. We cannot do uh, easily many photon absorption. So the first applications of this theory will be along the lines as you, you will talk about uh, in a little while. It will be few photon processes 
where, for example, and this is what we would like to do is, uh, Tony has some very nice results in helium. It's interesting to think about, can we do similar things for beryllium with this type of technique? Few photon, but now four electrons, described in some uh, approximate manner. This, this is the kind of thing we, we want to look at in the, in the future. We have done a lot of innovation. Yeah. You get your fix, fixed core. Yeah. Yeah, so as far as I understand, we, we cannot solve the four dimensional equation because it is, they don't have the exact memory. Is that the only problem they have? So it's supposed to have the same memory. It's memory and computation time. It's just both it's both. I mean it's when you when you if you're good at doing programming. Right. You have some resources, and then you program according to the resources. So you can always design your program in most cases such that it's, I mean, if you, if you don't have so much memory, you can write it such that you use more CPU and vice versa. But, but anyway, I mean, the, it's, it's still a hard problem, so it's... But do you think it's possible at some point in the future we can actually do the full calculation? Is that the computational power we are? I know it, it's, it's very open question. We, 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 we can do some full calculations involving maybe few photons, right. but it's not, not this strong, not this strong drive. This, this I, I think will be extremely difficult, even, even in yeah, many years. Quantum computers may help. <laughs> I, have, I have one question, if there's nobody else. All right, you ask them, because you get the present. Uh, for this uh, number, double excitation, do you uh, for each exciting, it's only also one photon or it also absorbs several photons? How important is it in, in, in double excitation? In, in, uh, do you refer to something in particular in the talk? Or? Yeah. So do you have this plot of the spectrum? Of the spectrum, yeah. Now this is, uh, for example, where was it? This kind of stuff here, yeah. this kind of stuff. Well, uh, let's go back, uh, because this is actually also a good question, and, and, and the answer will be maybe of general interest, because if you want to test how accurate you have done your job in making some uh, time-dependent code, it, it's maybe nice to see what does, how does the spectrum look like. If you cannot diagonalize your Hamiltonian, you don't know where the eigenvalues are, say, but so so you have to get that in some other means, and this is what we do here. We just we just take our system, and then we slam it with this guy, which is a half size point. And then when you do that, and if this is short, it has the extremely broad spectrum, right? So we start in the ground state here. Here is the ionization vessel, but we 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 put something in here, which is so short that it's like it's not the so this is energy. If you have a photon. It's maybe of that looking like this, right? The photon of a laser field of certain bandwidth. This would maybe be the energy. But this one is so short that you have kind of continuum. So we, we excite everything here. And that's why we have all these states available. And then when we have done this excitation, we just look at the dipole. This here is the uh, dipole as function of time. And we take the Fourier transform. Then we see what have we excited. At least uh, yeah, in, the, in the dipole allowed region of the spectrum. So, so what we see here is are the states that can be reached from the ground state by dipole excitation. So P Pierre just motioned to me that if I were to ask one more question, I may not have a place to sleep tonight when I get back. <laughs> so with that, I think I, what I will do is this. We will take a few minute break, and those who have questions should come forward to the podium and ask uh, Doris their last questions from him. And then uh, we'll come back for the last lecture today by Tony Starks. Okay. Oh, 